All right, welcome to the last video covering uh, conservation and momentum style problems. Um, the video will be split into three parts. The first part, I'm just going to talk uh, generally about collisions, explosions, under what conditions can we use these equations, um, and just classifying the kinds of uh, collisions that we'll be talking about, uh, just to help, or help us organize our thoughts. Uh, then we'll look at, so the second part of the video will be 1D uh, cases, 1D uh, examples, or, or just talking about the general case in 1D, and then uh, talking about 2D motion for the third part. So this example problem looks like it'll be the 2D case in the third part of the video. So we'll get back to this one. But first we need to introduce you know terms like perfectly inelastic. What, what does that mean? Okay, so... Um, even before the textbook's discussion, so the textbook maybe jumps into the 1D case, so I want to do a little bit more of an intro before that. Um, I want to remind you of what Newton's second law looks like for systems of particles. Um, so the sum of the external forces on the system uh, is equal to the total mass of the system uh, times the, and I'll write it this way, the derivative of the center of mass of the system with respect to time. F equals ma, basically, except that a is the center of mass acceleration. It's the total mass of the system, and then only external forces can, can change that. Um, okay, so I want to... Um, so let's multiply both sides by dt and integrate. Okay, so integral of some of the external forces on the system, dt, <clears throat> um, is equal to, uh, and then we're, so by the way, we, we can write this as uh, d momentum of the system as well, by dt. Um, so this is equal to integral dp system, uh, or in other words, the change in momentum of the system. Okay, so... We have so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a lot of problems where we're going to say that this term is zero. So we want to know when we can use these equations. When, when is the momentum conserved? When is the momentum of the system conserved? Conservation momentum means no change in momentum. It means delta p system is zero. Uh, so when is this term zero? Is the question. When is this zero? And there are two ways to think about what, how this could equal zero. So. Uh, first of all, you could have the sum of the external forces e equaling zero. Sorry, this is a vector equation. The sum of the external forces equaling zero will definitely lead to that being zero. So if you're integrating zero over any amount of time, then you'll get zero. And that's actually what we talked about in previous videos. Um, but more often than not, that term is not zero. But we look at collisions and explosions because they happen over short, short enough a time interval that the external impulse is actually pretty tiny compared to the uh, impulse on any individual object within the system because of internal forces. So in other words, the, the internal forces are so much bigger than the external forces that we can neglect the external forces for that short time period over which the collision or explosion occurs. Um, so this is... This is the net impulse. This is the sum of all the impulses, by the way. Um, so the momentum's conserved if the net external impulse is zero. So we can, so that's, that's zero if there's no, no external force, or if the forces act over a short time interval, or, uh, or if we integrate over a short enough time interval uh, that we can ignore that we can ignore any external impulses uh, <clears throat> so let me give you an example um you have a ball in midair okay you you have a projectile you throw it and then it explodes so gravity is always pulling down on that Let's call it a firework, not, not a ball, because it's going to explode. Gravity's always pulling down on it. And if you look at, you know, a whole second or a whole couple seconds, you know, gravity does a lot of stuff to it. You know, there, there, there's a non-negligible impulse, non-negligible change in momentum. 
But over the course of an explosion, you know, if you look just before the explosion and just after the explosion, gravity doesn't have enough time to really change the momentum by much. And so, approx you know, it's a pretty good approximation to say that the momentum is conserved. You know, we're ignoring gravity because the explosion happens over a small enough time interval that that external impulse is zero. Okay, and this is exactly why we're looking at collisions and explosions, because those things happen very quickly. Okay, so just this is a little intro for why, why we're looking at collisions and explosions. It's, it's mainly an artifact of number two rather than number one. Okay, um, so we also want to be able to classify uh, collisions. Um, so you know you have a collision. The first question to ask is, is energy conserved? Uh, is, sorry, uh, energy is always conserved, so the answer to that is definitely yes. Is mechanical energy conserved? That is a question that maybe is yes or maybe no. Is mechanical energy conserved? So remember, mechanical energy is this nice energy that you could get back again. So kinetic energy, potential energy, those are mechanical energies. Um, so the answer to this question is either yes or no. Um, so if the answer is yes, then you have what's called an elastic collision. Elastic collision. Uh, and in other words, the change in kinetic energy is zero. Well, change in mechanical energy. So maybe some of that energy goes to like spring kinetic energy, or sorry, spring elastic potential energy. Um, delta E mechanical is zero. Uh, or in other words, uh, K initial plus U initial equals K final, U final. So some of the equations that you used before with the energy chapter. Um, if mechanical energy is not conserved, then you have a new question. So first of all, then it's called an inelastic collision. And then you have to ask yourself another question. Well, so first of all, you can't conserve mechanical energy here. So some energy is lost to thermal energy. We don't yet have a good model for how we can take into the, into, take that into account or what we do with that. So for the purposes of our course, that energy is just lost and we can't recover it. Um, we'll explore that in another course. The relevant question to ask here, as for you know whether we can analyze this uh, um, collision or not, well, I guess I never wrote down a question here. Um, do the particles stick together? So the next question to ask in this case is do particles stick together after the collision. So in other words, is this a sticky collision? STI, I did not, was not close there. S-T-I-C-K-Y, sticky collision. Uh, and then that's either a yes or a no. So if the answer to that is no, uh, then there's not much you can do. Um, the reason this is nice, uh, if, this is, if the answer to this is yes, this helps you solve problems because uh, your final momentum of your particles is, uh, of, sorry, of, of the whole system, is the total mass of the system times one final velocity. So normally you would have to, um, so normally for the, for the final momentum of the system, you have to say it's m1, so, there's two ways that this could become complicated. So, so this could be the velocity of the center of mass, which is some complicated weighing, weighing uh, some complicated formula. And that, that's because the, the, the total momentum of the system looks something like this, m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus m3 v3, et cetera. And you'd have to add in one of these terms for every final particle. But if all of the final particles stick together, then they all have the same final velocity. And so there's only one final velocity. We can get rid of all those terms, and there's only one unknown there. And then you have the, the momentum of the system. So this really greatly simplifies um, calculations. And so uh, we call this perfectly inelastic, or completely inelastic. Perfectly or uh, completely inelastic. And the other one is called partially, this one right here, uh, is called partially inelastic. So perfectly inelastic collision, it turns out that is the case where you lose the most mechanical energy, energy that you could possibly lose and still conserve momentum. Um, so 
these two cases are like the two limiting cases in terms of energy. So, so either, you com either you conserve mechanical energy or you lose the most possible mechanical energy for a sticky collision. Uh, partially inelastic, you would have to be given more information about what happens in the final state in order to, to solve a lot of problems. Okay, that was probably a little too long of an intro. That's already been 10 minutes. Um, so let's jump into uh, 1D problems. Uh, okay, so we'll talk about 1D and 2D separately, and also even within those things, we'll talk about inelastic and elastic collisions separately. Uh, so 1D. Um, so we have, so we're looking at collisions where momentum is conserved for this reason. Uh, there's no, we can ignore the external impulse. So for 1D collisions, Um, just pick, okay, so, so we're going to deal with uh, two masses, m1, m2, and they have some initial velocities. So just call this the plus x direction. Okay, we're going to introduce variables that in 1D, they're not vectors, they're just numbers, but they can be positive or negative. Okay, so, so if, we, if we're dealing in 1D, we don't have to deal with vectors, but we do have to allow that those numbers could be positive or negative. Okay, so in other words, if m1 is equal to m2 and they're moving equal and opposite speeds, this is zero total momentum. So we don't want to just add up those two numbers and say that the momentum is twice the moment of it, momentum of any one object. Okay, the, the momentum here is zero. If they collided and stuck together, the final thing would be at rest. Right? Zero momentum. Um, so the point of me saying all that is that, so v1 could be positive or negative, and v2 could be positive or negative. Okay, so they're, if they're going towards each other, one of them is, um, so V1 is positive and V2 is negative in that case. Um, okay, so this is the initial state. So it, what, what might be useful is in any problem where you have a, a collision problem is to draw a before and after picture. So, so this is the before picture and the after picture. So what that means is that they uh, collided with each other, that you know they could exchange some internal forces, but there's no external forces done. Um, so we can conserve momentum. So, so the after picture is uh, M1 is moving with some different speed and maybe that's different. So your book is using a prime to indicate the final picture. Okay, so V1 prime and V2 prime. So right now the, the, there doesn't seem to be a big difference between these two pictures. Um, but if you knew more information about the problem, you could the picture really helps, especially in multiple dimensions. Then the picture really, really helps get an understanding of what's going on. Um, okay, so at the, so momentum is definitely conserved, and so we can definitely write that m one v one plus m two v two. So this is initial total momentum. Um, Positive if, if the total momentum is in the plus x direction, negative if the total momentum is in the negative x hat direction, uh, is equal to m, you know, m1v1 prime plus m2v2 prime. Okay, so uh, your book, right now this just looks like a ton of variables. Your book is assuming that we know that we know already. So at the start of the problem, we know what the masses are, m1 and m2. So don't, don't think of those as being variables. And also, suppose the before picture is completely specified. So we, are, we know exactly what V1 and V2 are. So in that case, our only unknowns are, there's two of them. Our unknowns are V1 prime and V2 prime. So, complete, so suppose the com before picture, we know absolutely everything about all of those quantities. And we're just trying to figure out what the two final velocities are in the after picture. Okay, so... Um, so we have one equation for two unknowns, uh, one equation for two unknowns. So this isn't enough to determine the final speeds. Need more. So this is exactly why, um, I, you know, there's this frowny face right here. A lot of times you don't, so if, if you just can use conservation momentum, so if you, if you have a collision, you can use conservation of momentum. Um, but in this case, in any of these, you can't use conservation of energy. Okay, so we can't use, well, okay, so, so for, sorry, I'm kind of talking in circles here. Um, 
Uh, I'm introducing this because I'm saying we're not going to go that route because we can't, we wouldn't be able to solve these equations. But there's two ways where we could solve these equations, and these are the two ways. So we're going to consider those two cases. So first we're going to look at this one, the uh, perfectly inelastic collision. Need more info. Uh, so there's uh, two cases. So uh, one is perfectly inelastic. 1D perfectly inelastic collisions. Um, and that's what your book does first because basically there's just, uh, the, this is easier. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just say that the, these, any problem where you have to do this, it's easier than if you have to do this. Um, and I think you'll, you'll get a sense of that by the end of the video. Um, so the other piece of info, if, if, if we have a 1D perfectly inelastic collision, then our piece of info is that V1 prime is equal to V2 prime. Right? If, they, if these two things stick together and they're moving together, so it wasn't obvious, you know, we didn't know, assume that from the beginning, so we didn't draw it that way. But if the two are stuck together, they're moving at the same final velocity. Uh, so we can just replace this with V prime. So V1 prime is equal to V2 prime. So because there's no distinction between the two, we're going to leave out the subscript and just call it V prime. So if that's the case, we can set m1 v1 plus m2 v2 is equal to the total mass times v prime. Or in other words, we can solve for our final speed. It's the total momentum divided by the total mass. And then we're done. So this goes back to what I originally said. If, if, the, if the two were equal masses and e moving in equal and opposite directions, so m1 was moving to the right and m2 moving to the left, then you would have zero momentum, so zero on the numerator. And it doesn't matter what the total mass is, the final velocity would be zero. Okay, so that case is easy. Um, let's look at elastic collisions now. So we, need, we already have one equation for our two unknowns. We need one more equation. And the other equation comes from conservation of energy. So our other equation is 1 half m1v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared is equal to one half. So that's initial mechanical energy. And here there's no springs involved, otherwise we would have to take into account the energy of the spring. But really it's just all our mechanical energy is in kinetic energy. So initial kinetic energy is equal to final kinetic energy. I'm realizing now I'm going to need more room. Uh, so this is one half m1 v1 prime. I'll put parentheses just to emphasize it's prime, the prime variable squared. I'm curious yeah, your book does it too, because the squared right next to the prime might look a little funny. It would be hard to read. Uh, and then the kinetic energy of the second one, m2 v2 prime squared. So we have two equations for two unknowns, two independent equations, right? These are totally, they're not saying the same thing. One is from conservation of energy, one's from conservation of momentum. So two equations for two unknowns. Um, your book suggests how you would go about solving these two equations. So in... 8.76 to 8.79, they give you some hints for how to most um, quickly solve for, the, for V1 prime and V2 prime. The answer is right here. Okay, so the answer is in 8.74, 8.75. Um, so the answer is in your textbook. Answer in book. Um, if v2 was zero so in other words if we had the case where we have m1 going to the right uh, with speed v1 and m2 was just at rest so if this was our before picture uh, then v1 prime is equal to so then then i'm going to ignore the v2 terms over here on the left so for the first equation i'm going to ignore the second term on the right hand side this one, if you can see the cursor, and then I'm going to also ignore this term if v2 is equal to zero. So v1 prime is m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 v1, and then v2 prime would be equal to 2m1 over m1 plus m2 v1. So, um, so let, let me help you think about this. There, there are three cases, 
which is why this is a little easier to, to think about than the holy W H O L L Y, not, not H O L Y, than the holy uh, general equations right here. Um, so, what's different about these, whether they become positive or negative or what, um, depends on the relative masses M1 and M2. So, imagine you had a light, like a ping pong ball coming in and hitting a bowling ball at rest. It's probably not too surprising that the ping pong ball is going to reverse directions. And if the bowling ball picks up any speed, it's going to be pretty small. Right? So we're looking at the limit that if m1 is much, much less than m2. So looking at the numerator here, it looks like if m1 is much, much less than m2, then that becomes negative. Right? And, and the denominator would be basically m2. So you get minus m2 over m2, or minus v1. So v1 prime is equal to minus v1. The ping pong ball reverses direction. Uh, and it hardly has any loss in speed at all. Uh, and then v2 prime is positive, but it just barely has any number, right? The numerator is much, much smaller than the denominator. So, so the bowling ball would hardly pick up any speed. Um, the, another interesting case is m1 is equal to m2. <clears throat> in which case, so this is like, imagine you're playing um, billiards pool. You know, you hit the cue ball. Uh, if you don't put it, you know, if you can ignore spin, because you can do crazy things with, with these billiard balls. But if you ignore spin, um, if you, these two balls are, are um, the same mass, and if one comes in and hits another one straight on, so, you know, it's 1D motion, uh, Basically, the, the cue ball comes to rest right here and gives all of its momentum to the other billiard ball. So we also see that coming out of this, this equation, right? If m1 is equal to m2, then this numerator is 0. And so v2, and then v2 prime would equal v1. Right? You would have 2 over 2 numerator and denominator. Okay, so, so uh, this equation makes sense if you, if you look at certain limits. Uh, in this simplifying case, right? So it's it's a way of double checking this equation to make sure it makes sense. Um, before we move on to 2D, um, to some things about what they call scattering in higher dimensions, um, I want to point out this example problem, um, and that is a ballistic pendulum. Ballistic pendulum. So what goes on here is that you have a block hanging from the ceiling, and it's really ma massive compared to a bullet, lowercase m, that's fired into it. So the bullet is fired, it's, it's moving at some speed uh, v0. Uh, it's fired and becomes lodged into the block, and then the block picks up some, some momentum, and so it so, uh, has some kinetic energy, and that becomes potential energy. So the, it, it swings up here, and then based on how, much, how high it went, you could figure out what the change in potential energy is and how much kinetic energy that block and bullet lodged in there had. Um, your book warns, and I, I will warn as well, because this is a really common mistake. You cannot just say, so if you have this is the before picture, uh, and this is the after picture, where it's this thing swung at some angle and the bullet's inside here. Uh, and you have some height right here. You cannot do this. You cannot set energy. The energy here is not the same. Can't set E initial equals E final here. At least the mechanical energy. You can't, you can't set these equal. Okay, this is a common mistake that students make here. They would say one half mv squared, one half lowercase m v naught squared is equal to total m, you know, m plus m g h. But you can't do that. Okay, the reason for that is that, and you have to take into account this intermediate step. So there's a before, there's a midpoint, there's an after. So what happens is that the bullet gets lodged into the block, which is a perfectly inelastic collision, right? They stick together, right? There's no glue or anything holding them together, but, but the bullet becomes lodged in the block as part of the setup. So it's a, that counts as a perfectly inelastic, sticky collision. And we know from, our, from, from this introduction, we, this does not 
conserve energy. Perfectly inelastic collisions don't conserve mechanical energy. And so if you do this, you're, you're totally ignoring that intermediate step where, you, where you've lost some energy. So the proper way to analyze this problem is to um, use conservation of momentum for the bullet going into the block. So mv0 is equal to, so this right here is a good equation to use. So he, uh, your off, the author of your textbook is warning that you can't do this. This is a bad equation. There, sh there should probably be more warnings around it saying it's bad. This is good. This is the conservation of momentum equation. mv0 is equal to the total mass times capital V, which is the velocity of the bullet block system after the bullet becomes lodged into it. So then after you solve for that velocity, then you can use conservation of energy. So once the bullet, bullet becomes lodged in the lo into the block and the block bullet system starts swinging upwards, that conserves energy. That it's fine to conserve energy after that. So your book solves for... Um, the energy um, of the bullet block system, and actually most of the energy is lost here. So the, the initial energy of the bullet was one half mv naught squared. This top equation right here, the equation at the top, is the final energy of the bullet block system after it becomes lodged in. And if lowercase m, so see this ratio, what's in the square brackets? That's the amount of energy that's left. So if the bullet, of, if the bullet has mass that's much, much less than the bullet of the block, Almost all of the energy was lost. You know, a very, a very small fraction of it remains. Okay, so you can conserve momentum exactly, conserve all the momentum, but lose almost all of the energy, and that's what happens here. Okay, and the fraction of energy lost depends only on the masses of the two things, not on this, the initial speed of the bullet. Okay, scattering in higher dimensions. Um, I'm not, I, 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 wanna, I don't want this video to get crazy long, so I'm going to solve the, the example problem. Um, so before doing that, though, I'll just mention that, that um, so in two dimensions, this equation, even if you specify P1 and P2 vectors, your final unknowns, there's four final unknowns, because you need to know in two dimensions, you need to know the X and Y components of P1 prime and the X and Y components of P2 prime. So there's four equations that you're going to need to solve for those four unknowns. Two of the equations can come from conservation of momentum. Because you can conserve, and this is the key thing in multiple dimensions, you can conserve momentum x component and conserve momentum y component. So conservation of momentum is a vector equation, and it's true for every component separately. Okay, if I had to sum up the whole third part of the video, it's that. Uh, so in multiple dimensions, in 2D, p initial is equal to p final in sum is a vector equation, so it's multiple equations. So this gives you multiple equations to play with, multiple equations. So in 2D, this gives you two equations to play with for your four unknowns, and then even if you can conserve energy, that's only one more equation because energy is a scalar. So that leaves one more, so, so you, that leaves you like still wondering how to solve the problem. And your textbook says, well, it depends on the initial impact parameter. So see this thing B in the, um, drawing here. So if you knew that a gold nucleus was at rest and an alpha particle comes in, you would need to know what that impact parameter is to know what happens in the final state. So knowing, knowing the initial momentum isn't enough. You would need to know the impact parameter. That will give you uh, the, the missing piece of the equation that you can use to solve for the rest of your variables. Okay, so that's what you'll do maybe in an um, upper division mechanics class is keep track of um, you know, find, this, find the, the final momenta, given the impact parameter and the, the initial momenta. Um, what you're more likely to see, so in this course, you'll either be given more info about the particles in the final state, um, you'll be given some info about the symmetry of the problem, or you'll have the easiest case, which is this. So going back to this being the easiest case, this is a perfectly inelastic collision right here between the car and the truck. Okay, so... This video is already 30 minutes long, so we're going to quickly go over this example problem. So our original problem has a perfectly inelastic collision between... Shoot, I forgot what A and B were. Uh, a was the car of mass M going at speed V0, 2 V0, sorry. And the truck, so twice as massive, is going half the speed. So 2M for the truck... Going there. So this is the before picture. 
uh, and using the power of colors. So the two are going to stick together, uh, get some mangled mess of car and truck, uh, and then go off at some final speed. And we're trying to figure out what that could be in the final direction. Or you could introduce a coordinate system, x hat, y hat, to talk about this. So, um, so you could talk about magnitude and direction of your final velocity vector, or you could talk about uh, v final x and v final y. That would also completely specify the final steam. Okay. Um, so, um, the final velocity is just VF, and that's true for both cars A and B. Okay, so the conservation of momentum means some of the initial momenta equals some of the final momenta, and that means two different equations. So for the X direction, in the X direction, only car A has momentum. It has momentum, it has positive X component. So in the x direction, mass times sp uh, speed, so this is for car A, uh, plus, and then for car B it's zero. So this is for car A, and this is for car B, maybe I'll label it with another color, is equal to the final mass, 3m, times the final speed. Yeah. Okay, there, there's actually a mistake um, in this equation. So as I'm labeling things, why don't you try and find what, what's the mistake in that equation? Maybe you could even salt, uh, pause the video, try and find what's the mistake in that equation. So this is px comma a, this is px initial. Sorry, too many subscripts, right? It's, it's the x component of... <laughs> This is the momentum of car A in the initial picture and just the X component. And this is the initial momentum of the truck of B, vehicle B, but the X component. Remember, we're only looking at the X component in this equation. Okay, so hopefully you paused. This needs to be the X component of the final momentum. This is the final momentum, but just the X component. So this is the total magnitude of the final momentum. We need just the x component. So this is also cosine theta. We need a cosine theta in there. Okay. For the y component, there's zero x component of the initial momentum for, from vehicle A, and then vehicle B has mass 2m and v naught, and it has positive y component of momentum, right? Because it's going up rather than down. So the y components say that these two sum to 3m times v final sine theta. Okay. So if we look at um, equation one divided by equation two, maybe you re you've seen this trick now. We have two equations for two unknowns. Our two unknowns are vf and theta. Everything else we're allowed to use in our answers, so we don't consider them unknowns. So you'll notice that the right-hand sides just are, are both proportional to VF. If I divide one equation by the other one, I can get rid of VF and solve for tangent theta. So on the right-hand side, if I take equation one divided by equation two, what that gives me is that uh, it looks like both of these are, this is 2m v naught and 2m v naught. One is equal to tangent theta. Maybe this is giving too many steps. 2m v naught over 2m v naught. 1 is equal to tangent theta, or in other words, theta is 45 degrees. So then you can go back and plug in theta equals 45 degrees into either one of equations 1 or 2 to solve for Vf. So then we're going to plug this, plug into equation 1. So we'll have 2m v naught is equal to 3m, and then sine of 45 degrees times Vf. So it looks like we have V naught times 2 thirds. And then sine of, so I move the 3m over to the other side. 
So 2 divided by 3, and then the m's cancel. The sine of 45 degrees is 1 over root 2. So it looks like vf is equal to 2 root 2 over 3 v naught. And maybe you could plug this into a calculator. You should, you should convince yourself that, um, well, maybe it's not so obvious that whether the, the v naught whether the, the speed should go be bigger than v naught or smaller than v naught or, or what. Certainly shouldn't be bigger than 2 v naught. Um, it looks like that's not the case. What you could do with this is see how much energy was lost. So it, it should definitely be the case, because we have a perfectly inelastic collision, it should definitely be the case that we lost mechanical energy. And so if you do one half, uh, so on, on your own, maybe you can double check with others, to see what you get. On your own, you should double check that one half total mass, so m plus 2m times vf squared, this is the total mechanical energy that's left in the after picture. This should be less than one half m, this is for vehicle A, 2v naught squared plus one half 2m times v naught squared. And if you compute both sides of this, you can see exactly what percentage of energy was lost. Right? Both, both of sides of this inequality, you're going to get some number times mv naught squared. Okay, so it looks like this one, it's three halves. So you get three halves mv... Oh, wait, no, I, I have to plug in for v final. So once you plug in for v final, you get some number times m v naught squared is less than another number times m v naught squared. So it should be easy to compare this. Even though things are in terms of variables, you will get a number in, in front of each of these. So you, you want to double check and make sure that you lost energy and you didn't gain energy, right? There was, there was nothing about that. We just conserved momentum in a perfectly inelastic collision. Um, and so energy was definitely lost in that case. Okay, this is probably my record for longest video. Sorry for, sorry I went over uh, usual. Um, so, oh, ugh. one more final fact. <laughs> okay, this was an inelastic collision. I'll just mention one more thing that your book does. Um, so if you have an, el so this was inelastic, this example problem. Um, going back to elastic, remember I, I said you can't solve for it because of, uh, you need the impact parameter. So there is one special case where the, if the two masses are equal, so an alpha particle and a gold nucleus aren't the same mass. But if you did have the same mass between the, of those two things, um, you can play around with the equations and show that actually the, in the final state, so two particles will be going in different directions in the final state. We don't know what angles those are at. But the angle between those two particles in the final state is zero. Okay, so the angle, so they're, they make a right angle with one another. So for example, again, in, with the example of billiards, of pool, if you shoot the cue ball, uh, not straight on to another ball, but kind of at, glancing at an angle, then the two balls will still have some energy, you know, they'll still be moving in the final state, and the angle between them is 90 degrees. Okay, so you might, want to double, you might want to double check that next time you play pool. It's gonna be really close to 90 degrees. Again, this is ignoring any energy loss and maybe some, and some spin. Um, or any rotational dynamics that go on. But it should be pretty close to 90 degrees, the, the two balls when they're after the, the impact. Okay, I'm making the video even longer. So, <laughs> okay, done with uh, this chapter now. Yeah.